We are going to be, you can start turning in uh, your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We're moving on. It only took us six studies to get to two. <laughs> We're going to be going verses 1 through 17, and the title of the message this morning is Working Until the Day of Rest. We've kind of been on this long look of history, essentially, of creation. It's a, it's a verse, or chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2, the very first part, is a summary of creation. And what's interesting to me is, and we haven't really discussed this too much, is that this whole account of creation, no one was there to witness. Kind of forget about it when we're reading it. It's almost as if it's an eyewitness account, and yet... There is no eyewitness. It is God at his word. And he passes it down through Moses to us. And man, what a magnificent God that he is. You know, I look at creation and I hope that you've taken the last couple of weeks to, to notice what's around you because in today's society we don't stop and slow down and take a look at what God has created. But more than that, I hope that this message so far through Genesis has done one thing, and that's pointed you towards Jesus Christ. Not debating about evolution, not talking too much about climate change and all of the intricacies of the Bible and how it leaves us hanging sometimes, but rather that all of this points to our need for Jesus Christ, and that is what we have to keep thinking about as we go forward. You know, I look at the complexities of this world and you should be reminded that we're at the center of it. Is that baffling to you? Still to me, and we're, we've already talked about it a couple times, it's just baffling to me that he would create the complexities of our planet, of our universe, and yet we're the center of it. We're the thing that mattered. We're the treasure in this world that he longs for, that he desires to be with. This week... It was a long sermon, by the way, if you were here. I didn't even realize it until after we finished. You know, somebody was like, no one stayed. And then someone was like, yeah, because you went over by 30 minutes. <laughs> and I will try not to do that this morning. Um, we didn't really get to finish up. I wanted to get all the way through these last couple verses last week, but we were running out of time. So we're kind of finishing this account of history this morning and then moving on to another section. The last part of it is here at the very beginning of chapter 2, and it's, it's essentially going to talk about the seventh day of creation and the completion of it, and let's just go ahead and read it real quick, the very first part of it. In verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Sanctified, whenever you see the word sanctified, it means set apart. He set it apart because it, in it he, rest, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So this is the completion of creation. It's, it's the very end of it. And there's some really interesting things in here, but I can't go on without telling a joke, so I'm sorry. <laughs> God, looking over at one of his angels says, hey, do you see what I've just done? I just created a 24-hour period of alternating light and darkness on the earth. Isn't it awesome? Yes, amen. And the angel replies, oh yeah, it is amazing. What are you going to do next? And God replies, I think I'll call it a day. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Most of you are like, that is terrible. So what is the most obvious thing when you're reading this first part right here in chapter 2? What is the most obvious thing that stands out to you or should stand out to you? There's something in this verse that seems odd to me, should seem odd to you as you begin to look at it, because he finishes the creation of the heavens and the earth. He finishes all of it, and he, he obviously we've seen from all the other verses, he sees that it's good, meaning he, it's evidence of how good he is. And then we get to the seventh day, and he ends his work, and what does he do? Okay, he rests is the answer. Let's think about this for a second. How hard has God worked? Most people are hard. This whole time is he lifted a finger. 
He's been speaking things into existence. You're talking about God who is omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. This God, he doesn't need a break. He does not need to rest. He's all-powerful. And he's not really done a lot of work. He's literally spoke these things into existence. So why on earth does it tell us that he rested? We're going to get there, and that's the correct answer. But if you have your Bibles, you can write this down or turn to it. It's Psalms 121, verse 3, or starting in verse 3. David says, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He doesn't need to sleep. He does not slumber. He's watching out for you at all times. Then Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He requires no rest whatsoever, and yet our scripture tells us he rests on the seventh day. By the way, you know, isn't it nice to know that God does not sleep or rest? Uh, Mary Crowley was a, I think she was one of the first women who worked for the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. She's, she went on to do amazing things, by the way, if you want to look her up. Her name's Mary Crowley. Uh, and cancer and a whole bunch of other things. She has served the Lord very diligently. Awesome lady, by the way. Is quoted as saying, Every evening I turn my worries over to God because he's going to be up all night anyways. And that's the truth. Aren't you glad that you have a God who does not... He's, he's all-powerful. He's all encompassing. He doesn't need sleep. He's always watching over you. He does not require rest. And yet here he rests. And we know it's not because he's tired, because he's exerted all this energy to create the universe because he spoke it into existence. He's not trying real hard. He's speaking things into existence, which if you think about that for a second, that's boggling of the mind. You know, I worked for a year to create a chicken coop, and it's not that all glorious compared to the earth. And he just spoke it into existence. And it's so complex. It's just crazy to me. So on the seventh day, why rest? Now this is something to think about because what is being done here is an example is being set. God is laying out an example in many different ways. There's so many things that connect to the reason why he rests. But I want you to think about this. Throughout time, throughout history... People have always had a week. You know, I was, th I was sitting here thinking about it last night about, you know, has it ever been any different or has it always been a week for people? Seven days and then they go start a new week. And you'll be, ha you'll be surprised. No, it's never changed. It's always been that way. The only time I think they tried to change it is the French Revolution. They tried to change it to a 10-week day and it didn't work out. And I don't say it didn't work out. God did not allow it. Because God had preset a week as to be an important thing. So who in here understands why that's important? Like, why choose seven, and does it really matter? It's a tough question, isn't it? The number seven in the Bible is a representative number of completion or being complete. Which here, you're seeing the example of why, as commentators, we believe that. Here's one. Because six days he worked, and the seventh day he was saying, I'm done, I've completed it by resting. In other words, I, it is finished. I have built it. It is done. So it's the number of completion. But if it wasn't for that number seven, did you know that your Bible wouldn't be accurate in its prophecy? Because it prophesies in that fashion, built out of the number seven. When we're talking about, and we've talked about it in Nehemiah a little bit, we were talking about how... The Bible foretold that Israel would come back and live in their land. Is everybody here familiar with that? Some of, a lot of you aren't, and that's not surprising because uh, a lot of people aren't teaching it from the pulpit. But your Bible to the day, and I'm not making this up. You can study it and your mind will be blown. To the day from Nehemiah building the wall, from the, from the order 
from the king for Nehemiah to go back and build the wall, it would be an exact number of days that it gives. And you calculate those days by uh, the number seven, by the way, to come to that answer. And to the day, May 14th, 1948, and Israel was declared a nation on the day the Bible said it would. Do I think anybody was like paying attention at the time? I don't, I don't think anybody even calculated it until after. And then we realized, oh, the Bible actually said it and called the day out. But if it wasn't for the number seven in a set of weeks, it would have been inaccurate. So God has an important mentality for making seven days. And on the seventh day, he rested as an example to us to give us a pattern. I don't, who in here has listened to Chuck Smith before? I don't know a lot of you have. What I really love about the man is that he's not trying to be ultra spiritual. He literally just talks and tells you what the Bible says, much as I'm doing to you. That's where I learned it from, probably, most of it. But when he's talking about this specific section, he says, you know, God gave us an example. He worked for six days and he took a day off. As an example to us that we should be busy six days and take a day off. And he's like, if we were to take a day off, we'd probably be a lot more healthy. We'd probably live a lot longer. We wouldn't have, you know, people dying of heart attacks and all these things. He goes on and he said, but my wife told me, yeah, you're preaching it from the pulpit, but you don't do it yourself. And then he says, you know, uh, yeah. And so I'm just saying it's not ultra spiritual. I'm just saying that if we'd follow the example God set, our lives would be improved. And that's true. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, and I, of all people, can say this. It is really hard for me to take a day off. Uh, there are times when I go for a month straight. A prime example, and you'll have to be patient with me today, yesterday, this whole week's been chaos for me. It just has not stopped at all uh, between work and and this and all the other things that I do. And so last night, I think, all right, we're coming to the weekend, you know, so we do study last night, and everybody hangs out. We talk for a while. It was about midnight, and then my phone rings, and work's like, hey, we need you to come in. So me and Aaron went in, and I had no notes, by the way, for this. <laughs> this is all done this morning. You know, and I look at it, and people are like, how are you still going? I don't know, honestly. It's because the Lord has given me strength to stand up here and keep my mind somewhat sound. <laughs> but in this... This, this example I'm giving you is that my mindset right now is focused on Sunday afternoon because it's my start of my day off and I need it bad, real bad. And I'm grateful that God set that example out. I'm going to tell you this. If you're not doing that, if you're not slowing down and taking a day to take a break, try it because the word of God encourages it. There were people who slow down and we take a break once a week. But with that being said, let me also encourage you that are being lazy and have an American mentality, get busy for six days. Because God was busy for six days and he didn't rest until it was finished. And we're going to talk about that. You know, like, how did you come to that conclusion that that's the, you know, that's the application in this text? If you flip forward to Hebrews chapter 4, you can write this down and look it up later. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9, starting in verse 9, says, Consequently... A Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. We'll stop there for a second. What does that mean? A Sabbath rest remains for the people of God, meaning it hasn't happened yet. That's what it's saying. And then it says, For the one who enters God's rest also rested from his works, just as God did from his own works. Thus we must make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall by following the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of the heart, and no creature is hidden from God, but everything is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. And if you're sitting there wondering, why did you read all the way to the end? Because the first part's the part that applies. The whole thing applies. Because when you get to the end of it, it says, by the end, before you go into rest, you're going to give an account. For what? What are we going to give an account for? 
Well, I'll tell you this. You're not going to give an account for how well you did to enter heaven. You're going to give an account by what you did to serve the king of kings. That's what you're going to give an account for. Does anybody stop and really think about that when you, I mean, is that like the first thought when you wake up in the morning? Like, I'm going to have to give a, an account to the Lord, so I better do good today. It's not mine. I mean, that's just an odd thing. It's not the first thing that comes to my mind. And yet here in Hebrews, it's encouraging us, hey, there's a, there's a Sabbath rest coming. It's coming. And by the way, it's really close. I, you know, if I have time and it, God would have to open the time. Uh, I'm not going to sacrifice my one day off, but I would really love to teach you and show you what the Bible is telling you is supposed to take place on the planet and how it is literally playing out at the moment. And it's just, it's nuts. But, you know, I don't know why it's so crazy to us because it's written in your Bible. We should believe it. But it's going on. I really believe that this day of rest is really close. So I'm going to give you an example. We'll rewind to last night. My phone rang, and I could have ignored the phone call. Trust me, everything inside of me when I saw that number appear on my phone was like, nope. But I'm not to my day of rest. I'm not done. And God has asked me to continue to be diligent in whatever it may be. I don't know what it is, but I know this. Be diligent to work for your six days. And you're like, well, that's not how it works for everyone. You're right. Those who choose to say, you know what, I'm working towards my day of rest, will we'll work the six days. Those who say, I'm trying to rest right now, will not work the six days. As people, we're called to be servants to the Lord. We're called with a purpose. And we're going to look at that here. But the Bible is clear that when we go to heaven, that is when we're going to rest. Look, at take your day off a week, but you better be busy about the things of the Lord the other days. Because it really does matter for the next life. God did not stop his work until it was complete and finished, and then he rested. And I think a lot of Christians are in vacation mode here on the earth. Thinking, well, I got saved, so now I just kick it until I get to heaven. And that is not what God has called us to do as people. He actually created us with the purpose. And I keep telling you the purpose. I'm just going to keep repeating it. And that is to be a light into the world. To be diligent in the things that he's given you to do. So I'm going to encourage you before we move on. That is really important. If you get one thing from this message, God worked for his six days and then he rested. And guess what? We're going to work until that day of rest comes and it's going to be fantastic. I'm going to tell you, this afternoon is a prime example. It's going to be fantastic. I cannot wait. I'm on the very end of it right now. Verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So here is the completion of your history of creation. It ends right there. This is the brief overview of all of creation. I love that it ends with this, that, you know, no man was there to till the earth. There's no man to take care of it, but God took care of it. And I love that he did it in this fashion. There was no rain, by the way, so when we were talking about, hey, there was no rain on the earth, that it was this environment, a greenhouse-type environment where the, the moisture was in the air. It watered the plants. And I don't know about you, but, like, I love rain. Who likes rain? Yeah, everybody here better put your hands up. We're like in the driest place of all time. But you know what I like better than rain? I love when I would get up early in the morning to go to work and there would be a thick fog all over the ground. Because it would be like the most peaceful, quiet. And it was like, I don't know, it's just odd. It's so weird and it feels awesome to be just driving through it. Not safe, by the way. I don't, I'm not encouraging you to drive in the fog. But... You know, this is the way the earth looked. And I say that to you. It's like, why, why is it important to even know this? 
And if you remember our first study together, this is what the earth is going to return to later. This is what you have to look forward to. You know, that, that God waters the garden. That he takes care of it. All We're, we're, we're going to help tend it, but God ultimately takes care of it. Today, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm, I'm excited about. Gardening God's way. You know. <laughs> Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, I love this. This is really important for men. Women, you can sit this one out for a second. You're not coming on the picture yet. We'll get to you probably next week. But this is really important for men because we're very egotistic as men. We're very, uh, we desire to be important. Most men I've met, there are a few that don't care. But for the most part, we, we as men, we feel like we have to be important in some sense. What does your Bible tell you here in verse 7? The very first part says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. God did not create man from gold. He did not create him from silver. He didn't create him from even bronze. He stooped down and created him out of dust. You all know what dust is. It's the thing that forms every two hours on your furniture. It's the most annoying and obnoxious thing on this earth when you're trying to clean. I love it. Man is created out of dirt. That's where you got to start. Men, you were created out of dirt. You're worthless in reality until God breathed life into you. Now, I say this because you are worth something to God, but on the just of it, without God, without having the Spirit breathe into you, you're nothing more than walking dirt. This is really important. I'll say mostly for me, but it is also important for you. I have to remind myself I'm nothing but dirt. God is going to use me and mold me and make me into whatever he desires, and he'll breathe the Spirit through me, and he'll use me. But without him, I'm nothing but a pile of dirt. Is that hard to hear as a man? If you follow Christ, it's not, it's not hard to hear. But if you say that to the world, they're like, wow, negative Nancy. But that's the reality of it. Without Jesus Christ, you're not a real man. You're just a walking pile of dirt. Before I knew Jesus, that's pretty much how it describes me. You know, I was worthless. But God took a worthless substance like you and I, and he breathed life into us. And that's what he desires to do. The word here is spirit. He breathes spirit into man. Do you know that that's what God treasures in you? Your body's a tent. It's like we're just passing through. It's just a temporary tent in this life. And someday you're going to get a new body or resemble this one. But this one's going to pass away. What matters to the Lord is your spirit. Amen. Aren't you grateful that God breathed life into us, that we're not just a pile of mess? Without an eternal spirit, your body is just worthless. Without that eternal being that goes on throughout eternity, and it does because he breathed it into you, you're just, you're just a worthless pile of dirt. Men, I'm going to keep repeating it because it's so important to realize and humble yourselves and realize that without Jesus, you're nothing. Without the Holy Spirit breathing into you and, and, and becoming part of your life, you're worthless. Worth is found in Jesus Christ and not anywhere else. And this is another concept, and I think everybody here, obviously, you know it. Our souls go on through eternity. Do you know there's a lot of people on the planet that don't believe that? A lot think this is it. That's where the word YOLO came from when I was a kid. Well, you only live once, so do whatever you want. Yeah, you live once in this life, but your soul is going to last for eternity. And what you do in this moment, in this life, matters for the rest of it. Verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, 
And there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's a lot of people who read this and think, and you may not be this person, there's a lot of commentators who go and talk about this. They say, oh, the Bible right here is contradicting itself. Because chapter 1 says he created all the herbs of the field and the trees, and then man. And then you get here to 2, and he puts man in the garden and creates trees. And they're like, see, it, it argues with itself. Well, yeah, it does if you don't read it correctly. Because we looked at a brief description of history of creation in one amount of time. This is the thing about the Bible. You can't trust the chapters and the verses ever. Because where one chapter ends, the story sometimes continues on into the next chapter. We just put the numbers in there so we can make it easy to find our place. So two continues the thing. But when we get to here, this is a, we saw the whole of creation in chapter one. And now we've come down to the Garden of Eden and we're looking at what he does there. Specifically for men. This is God creating a garden for man to be in. Now, I'm just going to stop there. Have any of you watched like gardening shows on, on TV or online? Am I the only weird person in here? Okay, good. <laughs> Man, I see some of these gardens that people are creating or like they turn their backyard into a paradise. And I'm like, I cannot believe how awesome that they make their yards look. Like I, I'm like that guy who looks at my yard and thinks, what can I do to make this amazing? I never have time or money, but I have ideas. But you see, God came down to the earth and created a place for Adam to be in. And this has got to be the most spectacular garden that has ever existed. And it doesn't really tell us a bunch about it. It kind of it, it kind of gives leaves us hanging a little bit. But you know, you zoom in on this garden and you look at it, and the description says here that, that he decided to put in fruit trees. Now, for those of you who don't know me, some of you do, my dad was really into this. Like, he really loved fruit trees. And so in our backyard, he had an orchard, and he would, like, spend, he, I can't tell you how much time the man would go out there. He would study for church, and he would spend a lot of time doing that. But if you were missing him and you didn't know where he was, he was usually in the backyard taking care of those trees. Like, he was tending to them. And here's the sad part, and I love my dad. He really tried hard. But out here... I don't care how hard you try to make trees look good. They look like they're in just terrible, like they're on the verge of death. Yeah, they produce some fruit, but if you drive down below and then you look at my dad's trees, there was a massive difference. They're doing a fantastic job. In my dad. But here's the thing is my dad put a lot of time and effort into it because he really cared about it. God did not put a lot of time and effort into this. He called trees to come up and they did. And it tells us here that the fruit that came out of it was pleasant to the sight, first of all. Nothing that grows out of here is pleasant to the sight. Oh, it may taste fine, I guess, but it'll look weird. I grew a tomato the other day, and it looked so sad. It tasted amazing, but it looked so sad. But everything that God creates for man is like, it's perfect. It goes on to just say, hey, I, God made this tree, trees grow up, and they were pleasant to the sight. They were really good for food. And then it follows it up by saying, hey, there was the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, who in here knew there were two trees in this story? I always forget it, okay? I don't know why, but I always remember the tree, obviously, of the knowledge of good and evil because it's what brings sin around, right? And everybody knows that. But I forget that it talks about the tree of life here. There's two trees. You got these trees that God has created. We'll, 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 we'll divert from the two trees for a second. And all these trees are like perfect. They're prize winning fruits coming off of them. I mean, like you'd be completely satisfied with this. And here's where it gets interesting. Among all these fruit trees, man has everything to choose from right at his fingertips. And then God places two other trees in the garden. Does that seem odd to you? Who in here has kids? As a parent, I read this and it makes me feel a little weird. Like, why put them there? Because men are mischievous. If you have kids, you understand this statement. 
if you put something you don't want them to touch in the room, what are they going to do? I guarantee you every time they're going to touch it. Now, I'm going to, this, for some reason, the Lord told me to put this in here, and so I want you to pay attention to this. If you're a parent and you are parenting, I have had people come to my house, and me and my wife never baby-gated anything off. We didn't baby-proof our house. We didn't move the things that are valuable to us up so that they can't touch them. And people constantly are like, that's just laziness as parenting. I want to tell you something. That's not laziness as parenting. Because what I want from my kids is for them to hear me and obey me. That when I set something down in the room and I say, don't touch this, I want to see them make a choice to not touch it. Why as a parent do I want to see that? Well, A, for their safety. I, I want to see it because I care about them. And that's really important. But there's another reason why I want to see it. Because how my children show me love is through obedience. Think about that for a second. I'm not going to condemn the parent who does these things, but I'm going to tell you that you're missing the whole point of being a parent. Because being a parent isn't to say, let me remove everything that might hurt you. It's to say, don't touch these and honor me. Because that's how you show me you love me. Is everybody tracking with me real quick? This is really important, and as a parent, this is one of the things that, that I take very seriously. I don't hide my kids from the world because I want them to understand they need to be obedient because it matters. So listen, if you're struggling with it and you're a person out there that like you've made it so that you, your, your child is literally protected to make only right decisions, I'm going to tell you this, and I know this is hard to hear, but do you really love your child? Because if you loved them, you'd let them make decisions. They're, by the way, newsflash, they're going to make wrong ones. But it's okay to make wrong decisions because that's part of learning. When you don't teach your children consequence, they don't understand how to behave themselves. But let me move on and just, we'll talk about the tree of life. I won't stay on that too long. Did you know that the Bible gives us more information about this tree that I forget about is even in the story? Do you know it talks about this tree more than just this place? Who in here knew that? Does anybody know where? Revelations is one of the place a revelation is. But let's just, I want to skip ahead and you can write this down or turn there. Genesis chapter 3 and I'm going to spoil our story in the future, but that's okay. In chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. He ate of the, of the tree. And he says he's become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. I told you, by the way, I'm, I warned you the last couple studies, that when we get in here and we start studying some things, some of them are hard to believe because it doesn't make a lot of sense. But did you know the Garden of Eden is still here somewhere, but it's hidden from us? That angels are guarding it so that man cannot return to it? Why was man kicked out of the garden? Everyone will tell you because he sinned. Your Bible tells you he was kicked out of the garden of Eden because they didn't want him to take from the tree of life and live forever. Is that hard to believe? A little bit, even as the teacher. I'm like, mm, okay, but it's what it says. So what is the tree of life then? Do you know that it exists in your future? Revelations chapter, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 says, when speaking to the church of Ephesus, by the way, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This tree exists in heaven, in the midst of it. And you and I are going to eat of this tree someday. Is that exciting to you? I think that's super awesome, by the way. This tree of life is promised, if you read that whole part of chapter 2, is promised to those who overcome to those who keep pressing forward, who persevere, who don't grow weary, and to those who repent and turn back to their first love, and that's Jesus Christ, who will repent and turn back to Jesus Christ. That who is who will eat of the tree of life. And that, by the way, ties into this study. That tree is for those who press forward and persevere. I'm going to tell you this, it's not easy to do so. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, hey, it's easy to serve Jesus and persevere. It's not. I'm a, I'll tell you, this week has really pressed the limits for me. But when your mindset is in this moment, in the next life, that I know this is my future, and this is the promise to me. The, the word of God promises me that I'm going to eat of this tree in a place of rest. I'm going to stay busy until I get there. Because it tells me if I'm busy and I persevere and I'm someone who repents, pay attention to this, who repents and turns back to my first love, it means that when I am steering off into the world, world that I realize my sin, I repent and I choose to run back to Jesus. I'm, my future is to eat of this tree. So I'm going to encourage you instead of tear you down, Please run your race to win the prize. If your mindset is focused on this earth, you're not going to run it well. You'll be taking a Saturday, Sunday weekend, and then maybe a Friday, Saturday, Sunday weekend, and then maybe a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday weekend. But the example set before us is to persevere. Listen, take a day off on Sunday or whatever day you choose. God does not care. The word is very clear about that, by the way. Honor him with one day of rest. But the other ones, be busy, not just to do works, but to be someone who repents of your sin and runs back to Jesus because that's where the promise lies. Revelation chapter 22, when you go to the very end, John is seeing this picture of heaven and he says, in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore, pay attention, 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Does this tree not sound like super fantastic? For the healing of the nations. Just the leaves, not even the fruit. Twelve different fruits. This tree is really cool, by the way. I cannot wait to see it. But it's promised to those who persevere. But then we also have in contrast... We have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I really don't need to talk about this one too much because it's pretty obvious. Upon eating the fruit of this tree, men gained the knowledge or had the ability to understand right and wrong. And that comes up in our story. But like I said, why would God give access to this tree to men? It's a really hard question to answer sometimes. Like even when I was sitting there, why? Why would God place these trees in the midst of men? God desired, or he desires currently still, he desires a loving relationship with you. Now wait, that doesn't make sense. So God desires a loving relationship with me, with Adam here. Yet he places two trees, one of them that can cause his demise, in the garden. Why does, that doesn't make sense. Does that make sense to you? Does that sound a little odd? Like it doesn't line up? Pay attention if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. True love is built on choice. Does anybody understand what that statement means? True love is built on choice. 
Does anybody have a hard time understanding that concept? Do, do you understand what that means? Because I'm going to bring it into realization if you're having a hard time. So, I have a wonderful woman. God has blessed me with like the coolest lady on the planet. Every man should be saying that, by the way. And she is, wholeheartedly, she's the coolest lady on the planet. And I put her through a lot, let me tell you. To be married to this guy takes a lot of work. Because I'm so serious about serving Jesus Christ that it never ends. And yet, right behind me is my wife to always pick up the pieces, to always be there, to do the things that I cannot accomplish myself. And she does it, pay attention, not out of command, but out of choice. At no point do I ever look at my wife and say, here's what I need to do and here's what I need you to do. Never. The woman just does it. That's why I tell you, she's the greatest woman on the planet. But if I had to command her to do it, do you think that I would think she loves me? You know, at any point, the woman could walk away from me and she could choose to. And if she did, I would understand because I am crazy. But she chooses to stay with the crazy guy. I don't understand it. But I can tell you this, I know she really does love me. There's no question in my mind. And it's vice versa the same way, the other way around, that in the middle of the night when my wife decides I'm going to move bunk beds from one room to the next and you just got back from work and you have no notes for tomorrow, that I stop everything I'm doing and I make a choice to help her do something, even knowing I'm going to be worse off this morning. I did it out of choice, not because she asked it of me. Amen. Why? Because she knows I really, she, ha she better know, I really care about her. You see, love, true love that you can trust is built off choice. If there is no choice, there is no love. It's not real. And God knew that. He didn't want to create a bunch of robots to say, we love you. He built us and created us to have choice. Because, yeah, he, and here's the, here's the kicker of it all. He knew we were going to mess up. Putting the tree there, he knew we would take it and eat it and fall into sin. Most people will look at God from this example and say he's hateful. He's a mean God because why would you put that in their path and let them sin? By the way, parents, if you're doing that, does that sound good? No, it's not. Because look at when I take and I don't block off my kitchen and the stove is getting hot, I know my child is going to touch it. I know so. And I let them approach it and I let them touch it sometimes. And you're like, what? You're a bad parent. No, I'm not. Because when they touch it once, they won't touch it again. Or they'll think twice the next time they go to touch it. Now, if you're my son, you touch it like 15 times and then you learn, but that's okay. <laughs> but I'm just telling you right now that the God is not a hateful God. He didn't do this because he decided to say, well, I just want to do a ex science experiment. Let's just plant this evil tree in the garden and let's see what man does. He knew. And you say, well, that's just mean then. No, it's not, because he knew also that he was going to come down and take your place on a cross to pay for that so you could spend eternity with him in a right manner. Is that an evil God? No, not by any means. In fact, it's the exact opposite because what God really desires, by the way, he doesn't need it, but he desires it. He desires your love. Now think about this for a second. If he desires your love, how do you show him love in return? By your obedience. And nobody wants to hear this. No church is trying to teach this from the pulpit. Because they say it's not works based. Just live your life and God understands. He died for you on the cross. Listen to me. That's a selfish Christian who cares about himself. 
if you want to return the favor, you know, I, 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 I do this all the time. I have to always stop and think about what he's done for me. And you should never stop. In fact, that's what communion's about. That's why we do it all the time. Because I want to be reminded how great he is and how loving he is towards me. Because in that, there's true love. Not because he spoke words or said, I care about you, but because he went and acted upon it. He died on a cross for me. And so the least I could do to show him that I love him is to be obedient to him. And the church has lost that ability, by the way. We've seemed to shift to a place where we think it's okay to be disobedient and still be all right and in line with the Lord. And listen, if you want to live that way, that's your opinion. But I don't just want to live. I want to live for him. And it requires me to, to be obedient. It requires me to desire obedience because the obedience shows him, I love you back. You know, I mean, even when you're not obedient, he still loved you and he still went to the cross for you, which baffles my mind and it should baffle yours. But ultimately, do we not, as a group of people who realize what Jesus has done, do we, should we not desire to be obedient to his word? When I take my kids out, and it's every time, like I literally, I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating you. Every time we go out to eat, it does not matter where we go. Everyone looks at me or comes up to me. Usually it's an older person and says, you have the most well-behaved children I've ever seen in my life. Always followed with, what are you doing? Amen. And the answer is, I give them choice and I show them the consequences of those choices because I desire for their obedience. And I get it. That's the, Because when you do it and they realize that's what's important, that's how you show love to dad. You're obedient. That's when dad says, great job, is when I'm obedient. Then they are obedient, or they try to be obedient. They're not always. I always tell that person, follow it up by, like, you want to take them home? Because <laughs> they're not always like this. Verse 10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became the river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havala, where the where there is gold, and the gold of the land is good. Badulium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel, which means Tigris, the Tigris River, which exists in our world today. And it is the one which goes forward or goes towards the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates, which also exists today. But here's the thing, if you're, if you just got like this little shot of adrenaline and you've become Indiana Jones right now, and you're like, sweet, we've got a map, let's go find it, you're making a foolish mistake because you, the rest of your Bible says that a massive flood happens and it changes the topography of the whole earth. It's not the same. Some things stay the same, some things don't. I'll tell you what changed waterways because water is flooding the earth. And so we don't even know what the, some of these are. We know the Tigers and the Euphrates, but we don't even know if it's the same rivers of their time that we see today. So here's the, here's the newsflash for you. We don't know where the garden... Don't let anybody tell you, oh, the Garden of Eden was located here on Google Maps. Because we don't know. It's been hidden for a purpose. And guess what? When we're not supposed to know, we're not supposed to know. So we don't go looking for it. You're like, okay, that's not... Important. Okay, let's move on. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Out of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but, if it, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now everybody knows this part because you've heard it many times. It's in the story every time. But I think we overlook one of the most important parts. First of all, God made you with a purpose. You're like, I know you've said it. And I'm going to repeat myself. God made each and every one of you with a purpose. For Adam, at this point, it was to tend the garden and keep it. For you, it might be to tend your house and keep it. 
It might be to tend and care for someone else. I don't know, but I can promise you this. God created you to do something and you have a purpose. Before the fall of man, I want you to pay attention. Sin has not entered the picture here yet. Keep that in your mind. Adam is still in a good spot. He's, he's sinless at the moment, for the moment. <laughs> That's going to change. But here's something to consider. He's tasked with something to do when he's good. He's not in sin yet. Why is that important? Because when your sin is removed and we go to the next world, you're going to have something to do. It doesn't change. When Adam was good, didn't need the Savior yet, he was tasked with something to do, which means when you go back to heaven and we're all there together, you're still going to have a task to do. You were built for a purpose, and I'm not talking about just this life. Yes, you have a purpose here, but you have a purpose in the next one. You're like, well, what is it? I don't know. You'll find out when you get there, but you're being trained for it right now. Hence why you should be busy working your six days a week and then taking a day of rest. Because we're to be people who are busy about the things that he's given us to do. But I want you to notice here that God just doesn't take man, place him in the garden with a bad tree for him to eat, and then experiment and say, go for it. Let's see what happens. But he did it with a purpose. Hey, God says, you can eat whatever you want. Whatever your heart desires, you can eat whatever. You won't get fat. How fantastic does that sound? Eat all the fruit you want and don't get fat. Yeah, not going to happen in this life. Not only is it going to be amazing, because you won't be fat, but the food will always taste amazing. And it won't just taste amazing. It's going to look amazing. And you can take from any tree at any time and do whatever you like. But hey, you see that tree there? Don't go eat of that one. Leave that one alone, he says. Pay close attention. Because God says the day that you eat of it, what? Pay attention. That's exactly what everyone says every time I say that. It says the day, of you, the day you eat of it, everyone answers you will die. Okay. God does not say I will kill you if you eat of that tree. He says, the day you eat of it, it will kill you. For those of you who have this mentality, and trust me, I hear it all the time. Maybe not from you in this room. But that God is an evil God. And that he will punish us if we do wrong. I want you to know something. It is not God that ends up punishing you. It is your sin that punishes you. Your bad choice punishes you. You know, my kids, let me rephrase this. When I was going through my life and I made bad choices and I suffered consequences, the first thing I thought is, how dare you punish me? Who in here has done that? I'm glad there is one other person in this room that has done that. Okay, two, good. I have done that many times and thought God is punishing me because of my disobedience. And yet, come to the other side of it and I realize what punished me was my own doing. It was my mistakes that punished me and yet God loved me throughout it. The consequence did not go away because God loved me, it stayed. If you continue to indulge in sin and you do not turn to obedience, quote me, you will suffer because of your sin. The Bible says your sin will find you out. And it will follow you. And you will suffer consequences from it. And this is not something that also is taught from the pulpit. Listen, I'm still, to this day, suffering the consequences of my sin. Still. Here's a newsflash for you. I will suffer those consequences until I go home to be with Jesus because I've made bad choices in life. But it's not God punishing me. 
It was my own sin that I indulged in. I was given a book that told me, if you do these things, you will suffer consequence. I was given the advice, the knowledge, and I did it anyways. It is not God that is punishing you if you're suffering. It is your sin that is punishing you. He is a loving God who desires you to love him in return, and he desires good for you. He does not desire bad for you. I desire good things for my kids. At no time am I desiring bad for them. Well, <laughs> if I was a perfect father, at no time would I desire bad for them. But it doesn't mean that their sin is not going to cause them consequence. I never stop loving them, but when they're disobedient, I know there's a price to pay. They know there's a price to pay. God desires for you and I to return to him because he doesn't want to see us damaged and destroyed. And, you know, I always look at God and say he's always provided a way to get out of it. He showed us grace and mercy when we did not deserve it, and he died on the cross. So listen, if you're, if you're listening and you're a parent, I think a lot of you, and this is, if you're a grandparent, listen up. A pastor once said, Jack Hibbs is quoted as saying, I show my kids discipline 99% of the time. But 1% of the time, I'll show them grace and mercy just to show them who God is. So they understand grace and mercy. But I show them 99% discipline because I want them to know it's important to be obedient. Amen. Now, that scenario can be adjusted however you feel God is leading you. But I'm telling you this. As a parent, be someone who teaches your kids consequence. That you show them right from wrong. And you let them make choices and you deal with those choices with the desire that they would be obedient and show love back. But how do you expect your kids to show love back if you don't show love in the first place? Kids emulate what they see, by the way. You can tell your kid a thousand times, don't do this. And then they see you do it and they'll do it. But if we move out of the, you know, the parenting section and we go back to us, I'm going to be the one who says it boldly and straightforward God wants your obedience. He desires your obedience. He wants to see you being obedient. And it's hard. Being obedient is hard. Ask any kid. But I'm going to tell you the reason why my kids are so obedient, and they're not always, but they are, is because when they are obedient, man, am I overjoyed and they know it. Man, am I, I don't, I just, if my kids obey while we're out, I'll buy them anything. If you behave and you show me obedience when it's hard, I will reward them any, anything they ask if I can provide it because I, I, I desire their obedience. And if that's who I am, and I'm a terrible father comparatively to God, how much more does he desire the same thing? to bless us and to, to show us that he loves us in return, but it requires obedience. Have I repeated myself enough? I hope so, because it's really important. Knowing that the only logical response to Jesus Christ is obedience to show him we love him in return. Shouldn't we be striving for that? We should. Are we? Not a lot of times. But I'm not going to leave this message and, and, and leave you with this like downer. You're like, wow, you really just ruined my Sunday. No, because what God desires is not your past to change. He desires your future to change. And it's as simple as saying, Lord, help me. You know, I think one of the things that I deal with the most when counseling people is that they say, I don't know how to be obedient. Welcome to the club. It's hard. But when you rely on your own strength to be obedient, you'll always fail every time. But when you go to the Lord and say, eh, the song, change my heart, oh God. That's important. To say, Lord, I, I don't just want to not sin against you, but I want 
to not want to sin against you. You've got to help change my heart to not even desire to sin. And listen to me, he will honor that request. But you have to have that request before him. And men, you have to humble yourselves. And not think that it's you that that causes obedience, but rather it is him in you that causes obedience. So I'm going to just encourage you this morning. It's as easy as saying, Lord, I desire obedience. That's what I desire. If you and I know that we have a future and that future is eternal and what we do here matters, don't you want to serve him and be obedient now? I do. I really do. And you should also desire the same thing. So this week, give it a shot. If there's a place in your life where you're being disobedient to the Lord, just say, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. I want to be obedient in this thing. Change my heart, Lord. Show Daddy you love him. Because he desires to see it, I promise. He desires to see our love towards him. And you'll show it through your obedience. You know, I, Paul says, it's my, 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 work, my good works are literally as filthy rags. And I'm sure they are. But if my, if my kid comes to me and gives me a picture and it looks horrible and it, I don't even know what it is. I think it's the best thing on the planet. And God is the same way. We could bring the worst thing to him. The simplest obedience that's like just nothing. And to him, it's everything. Because it's us loving him in return. Listen, he loved you before you were even born. Our natural response, our only logical response is to be obedient and love him back. So if you're not doing that, try it this week. It changes your life, I promise. (laughs) And with that, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us your word. And we, first of all, just can't thank you enough, Lord, that you would go and, and create us with a spirit and be able to make our own choices to love you or to, to reject you. And that sounds odd, but we're grateful that you gave us that choice, Lord. Lord, for those of us who have decided that we love you and we want to follow you and we've accepted this free gift that you've given to us, Our only natural response, Lord, is to love you in return. And the only way we can show you that we care is by being obedient. And it's hard, God. And I I don't want to stand here and make it sound like obedience is easy. But Lord, through you, all things are possible. And so we have this desire to lay our sins down at your feet. The places where we're disobedient or we're messing up, we have this desire this morning to lay them down and say, Lord, change our hearts. Help us to be obedient when it's hard. Because ultimately, we just desire to, to love you back for what you've done for us. And we can't repay you, Lord. There's, no, there's just no way. There'll never be a way we can repay you. But we desire to be close to you and to love you and to show you that we care about you. And so we ask that you would just help us with our obedience and whatever it may be, in whatever circumstance it's in. I pray that you would help us to overcome those, those obstacles. Help us to be people who shine light into the world that we don't, take a break on this life, but we're busy about the things you've asked us to do. But I also ask ask that you would give us that time. Make it possible for us to be able to rest like you've asked us to do. To honor you in one day that you've asked us to honor you in. Lord, I thank you for this study and how awesome it's been. And we're only a, a chapter in barely. I just ask you would keep speaking to us through through this study and that you would just help mold our hearts and change us, Lord. Help us to be like you and not like ourselves. We ask that we go out there this, today, whether we're going out to eat or we're going home to take a break. I pray that you would be the center focus of our day. Not just today, but every day. And we love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.